Okay, and good morning. We're here uh, in a new location. I'm not at home uh, at this point, and I'm trying to do all this on, on a laptop with just a trackpad and not my, my normal writing surface. So uh, hopefully the handwriting today is legible. Uh, I've already made a couple videos this morning, so I've, I've practiced it, but um, <clears throat> it's not gonna be as clean as my other ones were, which weren't clean already. So this, is, this could be rough, so bear with me. But today we're gonna to be learning about sections 7.1 and 7.2. Uh, this is on something called analytical trigonometry. But um, basically it, it's gonna boil down to um, using, using our knowledge of trig functions and their relationships with each other uh, to sort of, sort of perform like an algebra, sort of perform um, solving of certain things. Um, to, to sort of expand our set of tools, um, if you will, uh, so that we can solve more problems with, with different formulas that we haven't known before. Uh, a great example is um, the Pythagorean theorem, sine squared plus cosine squared is one, right? We right away in the previous chapters turn that in, into two other Pythagorean identities involving uh, secants and cosecants and tangents and cotangents. Uh, we're going to be doing very, very similar things today, um, creating more of these, these tools uh, from trigonometric functions in order to help us solve, uh, you know, more, more problems. Uh, but we're not going to be solving those problems. We're going to be creating more tools today. So here we go. Let's get our fabricating hats on. <clears throat> and we'll get started on that. Okay, so 7.1 is on trigonometric identities. Now we've used trig identities before. Uh, we've got some, some really, really well-known ones, I think. We've got uh, the reciprocal identities. We've got Pythagorean identities, as I already mentioned got even and odd identities. And we've got something else, which we'll get into here in just a minute, where, when I've got more space. What are the reciprocal identities? These are just the ones that say, you know, like cosecant of x is just the reciprocal of sine. And we've got secant it's just the reciprocal of cosine and we've got cotangent this is rough i'm so sorry it's so slow cotangent of x is here we go equal to reciprocal of one, reciprocal of one over tangent x, bingo. Okay, um, we've got those three, those are pretty well known. But we also have, and I don't know why they have these listed here, uh, in this section they list the definition of tangent and the definition of cotangent. If we just look right here at this one though, um, we know that this is equal to one over tangent, which is of course equal to cosine of our angle divided by sine of our angle. Okay, that's cotangent, and the reciprocal of tangent, which obviously means that tangent is sine over x, cosine. Uh, and then, like I said, we've got these three Pythagorean identities, which say, sine squared of an angle plus cosine squared of an angle is equal to one. And if we divide both sides of this equation by sine squared or cosine squared, we get the other ones. So they are uh, tangent squared of x plus one. Uh, that was a nice little tricky question on the test. Uh, is secant squared of x. I'll add the squares here in just a second after I write the last one. One plus cotangent 
squared of x equals cosecant squared of x tangent squared, secant squared, cotangent squared, and cosecant squared. And again, these were sort of just arrived at by modifying this one uh, through division by sine squared or division by cosine squared all throughout. These are the three Pythagorean identities. And then we've got these handy identities, which are even and odd. And this just says that sine of negative x equals negative sine of x. Uh, the next one is cosine of negative x equals, uh, equals cosine of x. It's an even function. And we also have tangent of negative x. If you remember, tangent is odd as well because of the sine function on top and the cosine on bottom. This is negative tangent of x. So these are, these are some nice little identities, but there's more. There's so many more uh, that we can come up with. And some of them you might have already seen or, or sort of intuitively picked up on. And the next set is the co-function identities. So the co-function identities uh, are these pairings between the six trig functions that we know, sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant. If there's, there's, there's sort of like a naming reason why we call these things sine and cosine and secant and cosecant because these functions are called co-functions of one another. And what I mean by that is this. If I take sine and I take 90 degrees minus some angle, okay, so pick any angle X, right? and I take that away from 90, well, that's gonna be equal to no matter what, the cosine of that angle. All this is saying is that sine is just a 90 degree shift of cosine. Okay, it's just a 90 degree shift. You've seen that in the graphs. They look identical, except they're, they're starting at different spots. Okay, the next co-function identity relates, uh, well, I'll put this one here right below it. Uh, the same two functions, but in the other direction. So what about this cosine of 90 minus an angle X? Well, that's also equal to sine of X. Again, it's just saying that sine is a, is a shifting of cosine. Okay, what about uh, tangent and cotangent? They have the same property. If I do tangent of 90 minus X, that's no different than just cotangent of X. And if I do cotangent of 90 minus x, then that is no different than just taking tangent of x. These two are just, again, horizontal shifts of one another. And this is the exact relationship. One is a 90 degree shift of the other, the other is a 90 degree shift of the one. And then lastly, we have the pairing for secant and cosecant. So that's what we've got. We've got these six trig functions, which are all related uh, through just horizontal shifting. And again, in our graphing sections, we've seen that, right? We've seen a lot of that. So uh, these should not be surprising. Um, so sort of the, the big idea here um, for this section is Using these tools, the ones that you see here in front of you, these things called identities, uh, we just we need to remember that an identity is an equation uh, that is true for any any variable that you input. Okay, so these things are just, just true statements. Okay, cosecant of x is always equal to one over sine of x. Okay, even where they're undefined, right? You can't plug in pi over two for sine for cosecant of x. Right, wherever cosecant of x is undefined, so is one over sine of x. They're undefined at the same spots. And everywhere where they are defined, they take the exact same values. Cosecant of x is equal to one over sine of x for every input. So this is, these are all identities. They're true no matter what. 
Um, a trig identity just involves trig functions, right? So the big idea from, from this section is just that we're gonna be sort of creating new ones or we're gonna be proving new ones. Um, and that's going to expand our tool set for solving problems. So maybe if you're on a computer, you can take a screenshot of this or if you've got your, your, your book open, just keep it on this page. Um, these are things that, you know, more or less one memorizes or has tucked away in the back of their head. There's others like double angle identities or half angle identities, angle sum, angle difference identities. Um, there's others that are commonly memorized to help with, with, with sections like this. So that, that's not a bad idea. Uh, but for now, just, you know, keep your finger in your book on the page or uh, keep a tab open with your book on this page to help us as we go along here. So first, simplifying expressions. This is gonna be just like algebraic simplification that we've done before. And the first one that we're gonna to go to is sine of x. Uh, this is gonna be interesting. Uh, over cosine of x plus cosine of x over one plus sine of x. There's, a, there's another one, another example in the book before this one, but this one, this one's a little less, a uh, little less easy, I would say. So uh, when you simplify expressions like this, um, it isn't necessarily obvious uh, that they can be simpler. Uh, so simplifying these things, often what it entails is using those identities or trying to trying to change this, what you see this, this expression in front of you into an identity, at least in part, in order to like remove things. And there's nice, easy ways to remove things. Um, for example, if you ever end up with like a sine squared plus a cosine squared, that's just one. So just write a one. That takes out squaring of two functions, right? That, that greatly simplifies things. And I think that's the best example of simplification. Let's see if we can, we can get something to work out here where something just drops out altogether. Okay, so the first thing that I see here in this expression would be to try actually adding these fractions together. So in order to do that, we need a common denominator which is also not an obvious thing here. We've got a factor here of one plus sine X and we've got a factor of cosine X over there. So our common denominator is actually cosine X times one plus sine of X. Okay, so maybe I should have put parentheses here for you, if that helps. This is actually our common denominator if we wanna write this as just one fraction. So what do we need to multiply our left fraction by? Well, it is missing this one plus sine X in its denominator. So we're gonna to have to multiply that up there in the denominator, in the numerator. So we get sine of X times one plus sine of X. And then in the right fraction, we're missing our our uh, factor of cosine x in the denominator. So we have to multiply by that up top. And that gives us something that looks nice. Something that I already alluded to. That's a cosine times cosine, which is cosine squared. So all I've done is find a common denominator here, which is the product of these denominators. That's going to be typical in these types of problems. Um, just multiplying all those denominators together and then fixing up the numerators with the missing factors. So if we, if we expand this numerator out, um, what do we have? We've got sine of x times one, which is sine of x, plus sine of x times sine of x, which is sine squared of x, plus this cosine squared of x. And that is going to be divided by, and here I don't know that it's gonna simplify much, but cosine of x plus sine of x, cosine of x. Add in the squares and add in my division line. I'll add in the multiplication sign. 
This is sine squared and this is cosine squared. Okay. So this, hmm, maybe, maybe we can simplify this a bit, right? Well, obviously we can say, well, hey, this is just the Pythagorean theorem. And that's equal to one. So this greatly simplifies down to just, there has to be a better way here. Can't copy and paste. Okay, okay, here we go. This is going to be sine of x. Over that denominator. Which is just cosine of x plus the product sine of x times cosine of x. Okay. Now that is pretty simple. I forgot a plus one. It's pretty simple, but I think that we can go one step further. Because what do we notice in our denominator? We notice we've got cosines being shared, right? Maybe I shouldn't have even, you know, distributed it. Because what are we left with up here? This denominator is the same as this denominator here. Notice that there's a factor of one plus sine x on top and on bottom. So this just simplifies down to one because the sine x plus one cancels with this one plus sine x down here. And what's left is just the cosine x. And that we know is secant just by definition. Or, or rather the reciprocal identity, secant of x. Okay, so all we did was we, we started with this expression. We tried to, you know, work with it in order to create something that we knew from the identities. And like I said, golden sort of the golden goose is to search for these sine squareds, cosine squareds, tangent squareds, cotangent squareds, et cetera, and, and distribute, or sorry, and uh, uh, remove uh, those things, replace them with just ones. And canceling common factors is a very common theme as well in these, except your factors aren't gonna be variables, they're gonna be functions. So you're gonna be dividing one plus sine X by one plus sine X, and that's always one. So that just simplifies very neatly. And the idea here is that we've, we've now come up with a much, much simpler way of writing this. It's just secant of x. Okay. So the point is you don't always have nicely written things like this secant of x. You sometimes get weirder relationships like what we started with uh, and being able to turn them into something simpler is, is a big deal. This, is, this illustrates very well what we're basically doing in this section um, because the next thing to do is to prove trigonometric identities. So let's take an example here. This is going to be one of the first, perhaps one of your first exposures to a mathematical proof. And um, so let's say, let's say we can, let's see if we can prove this one. If you take cosine of an angle, multiply that by secant of the same angle minus cosine of the same angle, let's prove that this is equal to, and here I'm going to put a question mark in between here, sine squared of that angle. Okay. So I put a question mark in there because what we're, what we're trying to do in this example is we're trying to prove that that equality holds. You cannot assume that it does. Right, we cannot, they don't even look similar, like 
sine squared and cosine times secant times cosine. You know, like there's these left hand and right hand sides look very different. But we might be able to show through a simplification process like we just did that the left hand side is exactly the same as the right hand side. Okay, now this is a big, big change from what we normally do with equations. Since we can't assume that there's an equal sign there, we are not doing what we did before, where if you multiply the left hand side by two, you multiply the right hand side by two as well. You can't do that because from the very beginning, we can't assume the equality sign is there. What we literally need to say here is, hey, there's nothing there. If I could wipe that out, I could, I would, but I can't right now. Maybe I can. Boom. There we go. There's nothing there. <laughs> Is there an equal sign? That's what we're trying to find out. So we're gonna take we're gonna take sort of a strategy here where we use either just the left side or use just the right side, and we try and rewrite them using our identities that are known into the other side, okay? Right, so it's like, it's like this. So we'll just go ahead and start working on it. It's like this. Let's take, for example, the, the I don't know if I wanna say the left or the right, it doesn't matter. Uh, we can take the left-hand side to start. And our goal is to turn it into a sine squared. So my first step, I don't know what to do. I haven't done this problem yet. Let's say we just multiply it out. Cosine x times secant x minus cosine squared of x. I just multiplied it through, right? And this is what we arrive at. So we haven't used an identity yet, but are there identities that we know? I think the answer is obviously yes. What about the secant of x? What is that? That is what? That's one over cosine, right? So we can rewrite this using that identity, one over cosine of x. Minus the cosine squared still. Now let's just perform this algebraic simplification. Cosine divided by cosine is just one. So this is one minus cosine squared. It is painful to write. Okay, one minus cosine squared. So that you're gonna see this pattern of perform an algebraic step or maybe a couple, use an identity, perform a couple more algebraic steps, use another identity. You're gonna rinse and repeat these things until, and we're right there, we have the solution. Because what is the identity for the Pythagorean uh, identity? It's sine squared of x plus cosine squared of x equals one. That means if I take one minus cosine squared of x, what do I have? I have sine squared of x. So I'll write my squares in here. Pythagorean identity is right there. So if I subtract over this cosine squared, I have one minus cosine squared of x on the other side. I have this. I know this is just this is a fact. That's an identity. I know that. And that's exactly what I need here. So we used a trig identity, a fact that is known to say this is the same as this. We use some algebra, which again is, is, a, is a step which simplifies something which says from here to here, we have an equality. And here we just used a trig identity, which means it's true. So we, we know for sure that we have this step is true. There's an equality there. And this is just an algebraic multiplication. That's definitely true. So we have equalities all down this column. 
on the left hand side and we arrive at the right hand side. What we've just done is proven that this blank space is in fact an equal sign. This left hand side, as you work through this algebra and trig identity stuff, we've arrived at the right hand side. There's definitely an equality there. What this means is again, we've created a new tool, a new trig identity that's dependent on these other ones that we know, but it's it's a new trig identity that says, hey, whenever you're forming, you know, computations using trig stuff like this, cosine times secant minus cosine, you might as well just square the sine of that angle. Right? You you might as well just do that instead, if if it's handier, for example, to do that. But it's just another tool in that toolbox of trig identities. Um, this is this is called algebraically proving. In case we're working with, um, as I've said, algebraic steps and trig identities, there are other ways to prove these things, although they're less substantial proofs. This is this is proof. This is irrefutable. Um, the other way to do it, uh, which suggests equality is to graphically prove. So I'm going to write that uh, here. Your text says in several examples and perhaps in some problems, um, graphically prove. It's important to note that if you were to graph the left-hand side, you would get some graph. And if you graph the right-hand side, you would also get some graph. Just because in the specific window, that you graphed your two, your two sides, just because they, they match up, they're coincidental on every point, doesn't necessarily mean that they're equal everywhere. That's an important note. But that's what your book wants, you, wants to suggest to you, that there is evidence if you graph the left-hand side and you graph the right-hand side, if they match up entirely, that is evidence that they may be equal for every angle. But in order to check that with a graph, you literally need to check every input, which means you literally need to check every real number, which is literally impossible because no graph is going to show you that. So what do you do to prove that two functions are, um, are the same? You have to do it this algebraic way. Okay. Or you've got to use uh, other, other sort of high power theorems to do so. And that's out of the scope of what we're doing here. Uh, but graphically, you can graph the left-hand side, you can graph the right-hand side. If they're coincidental, then that's suggestive that they are in fact equal. Okay. Um, there's not much more to this section besides proving identities. Um, I'm already at the exercises after doing that, so. Maybe this is just going slowly, I don't know. Yeah, that's that's kind of it. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna do more of these problems on uh, on Wednesday when I've got a nice computer mouse and computer setup instead of just this laptop. And then things will be faster and they'll be a little bit easier to, to do. Um, but that's basically it. Um, we're, we're using our trig identities and we're, we're trying to solve and simplify and, and prove certain things, okay? Uh, again, big hints would be um, number one with fractions, common denominators, are going to be just the products of all the denominators. That's because it's uh, what well, you usually, unless there's common factors of sine or cosine or what have you, but for the most part, it's going to be products of the denominators. Um, other things to look out for, try and use Pythagorean theorems to simplify things down to just one, right? Um, other things would be, remember your reciprocal identities. It's so like we had here, uh, that help to simplify out this cosine over cosine. Um, keep an eye on those identities in order to simplify.
And remember again, when you're proving something, you can't work both sides at the same time because there aren't sides until you've proven the sides exist. Um, there is another strategy where let's say you have a difficult identity on the left and something else on the right or difficult expression on the left and something else on the right. And you can't for the life of you turn the left hand side into the right. So one other strategy is to work your way down on one side, doing performing algebra and performing identities, then sort of work the other way. Take the right side and try and work it as well in the other direction. Because if I can turn this left side into this, one minus cosine squared, and if I can turn the right side into one minus cosine squared, sort of that intermediate step, well, then I've still got an equality there because I can work both sides and then meet in the middle. But you can't do things like, you know, multiplying both sides of the equation by two or things like this uh, because there are no sides, right? So with that, I hope that helps and I will see you in the next one, okay? All right.